Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Sam Hendel, and I'm one of the co-founders of Accelerate Yale and Yale Angels. It is my privilege tonight to welcome on behalf of our team at Accelerate and Angels, the Yale Alumni Health Network, and the Yale Alumni Association, our guest, Dr. Stephen Choi. Dr. Choi is the inaugural Chief Quality Officer for the Yale New Haven Health System and Yale Medicine. He spent the first two decades of his career as a pediatric cardiac intensive care doctor, serving as medical director of several cardiac intensive units. He has his undergraduate degree from University of Pennsylvania, medical, medical, degree, medical, degree, medical, degree, medical degree. He completed his residency at Columbia University and the Babies and Children's Hospital of New York. And he completed a, a pediatric critical care fellowship at USC and Children's Hospital Los Angeles. As Chief Quality Officer, Dr. Choi and his team have direct access, direct access to the front lines of the COVID-19 battle and are leading the effort for the largest hospital system in the state, Yale New Haven, to prepare its hospitals, liaise with state officials and the media, create a standard of care to protect hospital workers and patients, and now, unfortunately, treat an increasingly large number of severe cases of COVID-19 around the state. Most importantly for me, Dr. Choi is a dear friend and a fellow resident of Westport, Connecticut. And I'm so thankful, Dr. Choi, that you're able to speak uh, to be with us tonight and educate our Yale alumni and the broader community, um, all listening tonight about what you're about what you're seeing and your firsthand knowledge of the early stages of the virus search. Well, thank you, Sam, for having me. It's great to see you. It's been a long great time. As well. Exactly. And Dr. Choi, I will start off with this one. Um, have you ever experienced anything like this in your career? Uh, never. Um, I, I think I could speak for most, if not all of my colleagues. This is the first time we've ever you know, dealt with a healthcare crisis, um, let alone a public healthcare crisis of this magnitude. Um, it's, it's, a first for, it's certainly a first for me, and I think it's a first for everyone. Yeah, and, 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 and you've been preparing for this, you know, we, we sort of, I guess, you know, knew it was coming maybe about two months ago. Um, you know, you've been preparing for some time. I would love to hear what you did in, in anticipation of the surge in cases we're now seeing and what surprised you? Uh, what's changed from your expectations when you first started preparing to what you're seeing in real time? Sure. So I, I think all of us in the U.S., when we you know first heard about the reported cases in China, um, you know, we're all hands on deck. Uh, we started with, you know, preparing our screening process. And, and by that, I mean, you know, we had to speak to all our providers, whether it was an ambulatory practice, the emergency room, uh, the hospital in general, that whenever patients came, we would screen for travel. Um, and you know, within a couple of months, you know that that screening process no longer exists because it's a pandemic. You know, you're you're yeah. at risk for getting coronavirus now. You know, traveling from anywhere or even just walking outside in your neighborhood. Um, and then we set up our COVID call center, which I think has made a huge impact, um, at least in, in our region, by you know informing the public, uh, you know, talking to our doctors, talking to public health departments, uh, other hospitals, but most importantly, the patients and the general public. And I think because of that, uh, we've been able to divert a lot of unnecessary uh, visits to the emergency room, uh, which unfortunately is what, you know, is being seen in New York City. So we fielded yeah. over, I want to say 35,000 calls um, just in the last three or four weeks. And many of those calls are from sick patients. And you know, we, we've given advice to patients about you know, what they could do in terms of taking care of themselves, not having to go to a doctor's visit, you know, not going to work, not show, showing up to the emergency room where they could potentially expose other patients and also expose other healthcare workers. Um, we really ramped up as best as we could you know, our, our internal testing capabilities, um, and that's twofold. Uh, number one, we, we had to create centers where we could collect samples to then test. Um, and those are those drive-by or drive-through centers. We have them all up along uh, the southern coast of Connecticut. We have one at Greenwich Hospital, 
Bridgeport, Milford, we have two in New Haven, we have one in New London, and we have one in Westerly, Rhode Island as well. And then those samples get sent out to a number of laboratories, but for the, the sickest patients, we actually set up our own internal lab um, through our uh, virology lab at, at the med school. And that's that's been a real game changer, particularly in the in the last week. Um, yeah. In order to prepare for beds, you know, we cleared out the top three floors of our north tower in anticipation of a surge of, of patients, which we're you know finally starting to see. Yep. And are you starting to fill those beds right now, or is it still to the point where you have some excess capacity that you're ready for the increased surge? Um, we're, we're definitely filling those beds. Uh, we have, you know, over 300 uh, inpatients with COVID that are being cared for across our health system. Um, but, you know, fortunately, we do have capacity and we're hoping to create more capacity at each of our hospitals. Yeah. And I remember about a month ago, we talked about containment versus mitigation. Can you explain that to everyone and also just talk about you know, the, the change in testing and the, the, I guess the lack of availability of testing when we first sort of started to see a few cases come in, what that's meant for the entire, not just Connecticut, but the entire country, and where do we stand now in terms of testing? Sure. So uh, two, two of the monikers that people throw out a lot uh, when you're dealing with a pandemic or an epidemic is, is the two strategies called containment and mitigation. Uh, we're cl clearly at mitigation. The early phases of con containment involve identifying uh, those patients who are infected, um, rapidly isolating them, and, and depending on where you live and you know what the norms are, you, you can actually enforce quarantine. And the reason we do that is we try to minimize the spread as much as possible so that only a few patients or very small communities are infected. Um, that requires a lot of infrastructure, requires a lot of support, uh, both for, for those patients as well as the public health community as a whole. Uh, the foundation of containment really involves testing. Uh, as you can imagine, if you have no testing, you have no idea who's infected. Um, once you're past the threshold to contain, you move to mitigation. And that's really where we've been since really the epidemic started here in the US and now it's a pandemic. And mitigation involves just slowing down the transmission. You know, what are the means and measures we could take to slow down the number of patients that get infected so that we could, you know, quote unquote, flatten that curve. Great, great. And, and I, I know we're talking about a very serious topic, but I'm gonna let you, you, you and I discussed, um, I, I know your kids are out there um, yes. watching this right now. I'd love to yep. give you a chance to, sh to, to, to shout out. Um, to, to, to your kids. So. Oh, thank you so much. I have not seen my kids in almost a month. So I want to shout out to uh, my son, Ethan. I love you. Proud of you. And I have a special shout out to my special six-year-old daughter, Alex, who sent me this beautiful <laughs> little picture where she wrote, I love you, daddy. I love Yale. Love you. Um, hope to see you guys soon. Thanks yeah, for letting me do that. Of course, my friend, and, and, and for me, you know, I'm doing my part by sitting on my couch and, and staying home. Yeah. And um, really it's a credit to, to you and your team that you're sacrificing so much for, for all of us. And you, what, what, what message would you have, one, for, for the whole community um, about what we, what we all can be doing to you know, flatten the curve, as you said, and, and really sure. you know, nip this thing in the bud as quickly as possible? Yeah. So. Um, one of the things I've been trying to message through all our media circuits and all our news outlets is that we cannot win this battle if people outside of the hospital don't do their job. And by that, I mean, we have to practice strict adherence to those social distance, distancing measures that our governor enforced a couple of weeks ago. And you, know, you and I were on the phone with a number of state reps trying to promote that. But that really is the only way to now contain and mitigate as much as possible the surge of patients coming into the hospitals. And I think the public needs to understand, you know, while we can, you know, make more beds, uh, order more ventilators, order more equipment, it's really, really impossible 
to manage all the patients who will eventually get infected, eventually require hospitalization, and most importantly, the ones who eventually require ICU care, uh, if, if they all come in within a short period of time. And a short period of time is not days, it, it's even just weeks, that, that, that's just too much. So as much as possible, we want to spread the number of infections and spread the number of hospitalizations over months. Um, and when I say months, I'm talking two, three months, Sam. I'm not talking about one month yeah. or two months. And it might even be longer in terms of how much bed capacity and how much ICU capacity we have in the state. And certainly you're seeing this in New York, particularly in New York City, where, where patients are just flooding into the hospitals. And the doctors, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the pharmacists, they just can't keep up with the demand that's coming in so quickly. And we'll certainly, I'm, I'm going to ask you about, you know, the PPE and ventilator issue a little later in our talk. Um, maybe I'll ask you a question right now. because I, I know there, there are a lot of parents out who are, who are, who are watching, who are watching, uh, watching us. We all have a really great response to this. And that's a credit to you, Dr. Choi. Um, and I think clearly this is a, this is of utmost importance for, for all of us watching. Um, but a lot of parents out there who have kids, um, you know, can, can you explain, um, you know, sort of advice you have for my family and the other families out there about the risk for their children from the virus? Sure. So number one, I would say try to avoid any large crowds as much as possible. Um, I do encourage, you know, uh, you know, my close friends and family to, to go outside and exercise, but do it responsibly. You know, don't do it in crowds keep that safe distance of, of six feet. You know, it's really important during this time for, for people's, you know, mental health, their anxiety, you know, not to be, you know, locked in into a house or, you know, one room. We, we want people out there, but you gotta be responsible in terms of, you know, how you interact with others and what you do outside. But for, for parents and, and particularly those who've got adolescents and teenagers who, who have difficulty you know, staying inside. Um, staying in the house and not going crazy. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, <laughs> we're actually seeing uh, children um, get very sick from this. So I think the initial reports that we heard and read from China aren't necessarily translating to what we're seeing here. We're, we're seeing young adults, we're actually seeing children, uh, certainly in New York City, that are being admitted to the ICU, uh, you know, at least one of the large children's hospitals has a number of kids who are, you know, not only in the ICU, but also, you know, mechanically ventilated. Um, you know, those are the breathing machines that sustain life when the virus invades your lungs. So I, I, no, yeah. no one is immune to this virus, Sam. And I certainly don't want to scare anyone, but, you know, um, it's important. It's, it's important for all of us to hear the truth. Um, are, are, are we seeing it from healthy children without other comorbidities who are getting you know, very, very sick from this and having to go to it to an intubator? The, the overwhelming number of kids who have gotten sick from this do have comorbidities, but there are, you know, unique reports of children who are reportedly healthy um, that are getting pretty sick, uh, we, you know, and, and that's what's scary. And, 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 and for those children who don't get sick, remember, they could easily bring that home and give them, yeah. give them to their, uh, you know, 30-something-year-old parent, um, or their 50, 60 year old parent or their 60, 70 year old grandparent. And, and, and you, we know that patient group or that age group certainly does not fare as well. So everyone's at risk. And if the kids don't get sick from getting the infection, they can certainly be vectors for transmitting it to the older people, whether it's in their household or uh, people that they come in contact with. And so we'll continue you know, to I have, have I, I do have to put a plug in also that. The more people are outside, the more the, the more they sort of bend the bend the you know the rules, the higher risk that the healthcare workers are as well from contracting this. And you know we can order ventilators, we can make ICUs, we can we create more masks, but we can't order healthcare workers, and we can't order nurses, and we can't order pharmacists and respiratory therapists. You know th those are resources that are absolutely vital and. You can't just have them shipped or manufactured. And we're, we're certainly seeing that um, in New York. We, we saw it in Italy and China, but uh, we're starting to see that in Connecticut as well. 
Maybe I'll ask you about some of the symptoms that we're seeing. So we've all heard, you know, fever, dry cough, chills, fatigue, et cetera. Yeah. What is it about the virus that's causing mortality in certain patients? And what are some factors your team is seeing as to what some, uh, what, why some cases are mild and why other patients are dying? Sure. So, so the, the typical symptoms are, are still what we originally thought they were, which is, which is what you said, fever, cough, shortness of breath. But, but, but this virus can, can absolutely disguise itself as a, a common day cold or the flu. Uh, we've seen some unique symptoms, and, and many of you have probably read this you know, on, in the media. A lot of people, or not a lot, but a proportion of people are actually presenting with loss of smell and taste, uh, which is unusual. And then we also know that there's a small percentage of patients that present with GI symptoms. And by GI symptoms, I mean, you know, vomiting, diarrhea, or nausea. Um, when we talk about what the morbidity and mortality is, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of patients who do succumb to coronavirus, um, you know, die because of the illness in their lungs. Um, the virus attacks a particular cell in the lining of your lungs, and, and those particular cells are, are, are designed to clear all the debris, all that junk, the dust, particles, um, other bacteria, other, other, you know, soil that is in the air. So if you're, you know, running outside, most people, you know, will start getting cough because your lungs are trying to expel all those particles. Well, this virus attacks those cells. So as a result, your, your lungs are more prone to getting infected. Uh, your lungs are prone to uh, a real massive inflammatory response. And what they're finding with the patients that really get sick, and certainly the ones um, during autopsy, is that there's this thick, um, almost sludge, this like pasty um, goo inside the lungs. And the lungs are really the ones that take the biggest hit. But what we're now learning is that you, know, you get multi-organ system failure. So your, your kidneys can get shot, your liver, and it also attacks your heart. So on autopsy, we're actually finding uh, infiltration and, and disease in those other organs. So this, this you know, makes this virus very dangerous for those who do succumb to it. So it's not just the lungs, it can attack the other vital organs in your body. And so of course, we're probably scaring the crap out of everyone watching this, which is a, which is a good thing. Um, but what, what, what's, what, 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 what are we seeing in terms of overall mortality rate um, you know, sure. do we have any sense of what, you know, and it seems like there are a lot of asymptomatic people who are getting this, um, mm -hmm. any sense of what the real, the true percentages are that are actually going to the ICU and then unfortunately passing away? Yeah. Well, um, no estimates perfect, but, you know, based on the sort of the global demographics, my best guess would be about 1%. Um, you know, South Korea, which is really kind of seeing the tail end of COVID there, I think they're going to end up at around 1%. Um, and you've probably heard all the experts comment that, you know, the mortality is, you know, fairly driven about, driven by your capability of testing, right? So if you can only test the sickest patients, then your mortality will be skewed yeah. to a much higher number. But if you've got nations like South Korea, uh, which was testing almost 10,000 patients a day, you know, their mortality wasn't as high. Um, what, what's probably more important is, is a breakdown in the demographics for those who get infected, uh, about 80%, and that's been consistent both overseas and in the U.S., about 80% of people who get infected, th they'll be fine. Th they'll recover without, you know, any significant disease. And in fact, we, we think many people are walking around with, COVID right now, which is what makes this disease scary. Um, they can be almost completely asymptomatic. Uh, so that's 80%. Another 10 to 15% um, do develop you know, severe symptoms where they do have to get hospitalized. And those patients um, will you know, need some form of oxygen, uh, will need IV fluids, because often they'll have difficulty you know, uh, breathing, and then therefore they can't drink or eat. And then it's that 5% um, that get very sick. Um, and those are the patients that end up in the ICU. And those are the patients that uh, need a breathing tube and end up being mechanically ventilated. 
And then for, for, for patients that are feeling symptoms, what, what, what are some, uh, clearly age and, and comorbidity is, is, is a factor. Are there any other things that, you got that, that, that the, the medical community has discovered here that are sort of other, and maybe they're random, but, but other sort of um, you know, triggers for higher likelihood of hospitalization? And then if someone has the disease also, at what point should they call you guys and actually go, go to the ER? Um, sure. what, what, what are the signs that they should really uh, seek additional help? Yeah, so, so number one, I, I would say, please call us. By, by no, no means are we saying, don't call. What we're saying is, don't just show up in the emergency room, don't just show up at your doctor's office. Just call ahead. Unless you, you're, you're severely ill where you really can't breathe, and you have shortness of breath. Uh, number two, uh, what, what we're really trying to uh, promote is that, you know what, you can fight this virus just like you could fight any other virus. So um, sleep well. And this is probably the first time where I tell people, sleep in. You know, I tell- You tell me, just sleep yeah, and relax. I yeah. tell all my close friends, you know, this is a perfect time, just get your rest. Um, that was for Jane Green. Um, Eat well, you know, you know, eat healthy, um, wash your hands, you know, practice really good hand hygiene, you know, uh, don't do things that could increase your risk for infection. So, you know, people who are worn out, people who are not eating well, people who are, who've got lack of sleep, you know, those, those people are actually risk, uh, at risk for infection. Yeah, I, I'm a true believer of an antioxidants, so I juice up with vitamin C uh, twice a day. Um, so, you know, th that's, that's a strategy you can take. Um, and what we are seeing is that patients who have comorbidities do worse. Um, and that's diabetes, um, uh, chronic lung disease, whether it's COPD, emphysema, uh, asthma, um, people with other heart disease, um, people with, you know, immunocompromised or immunosuppression uh, tend to do worse as well, too. And we're still seeing the, you know, elderly patients, you know, not fare as well. But what's distinctly different uh, that we're seeing the last week or two is that we, we've got young, healthy adults that are getting very sick. And we didn't necessarily anticipate that from the early reports out of China, out of Europe, but we're cer cer certainly seeing that here, Sam. Yeah, that's, that's, it's, yeah, it's, it's serious stuff. Um, and I'm taking your advice and having two uh, emergencies a day. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping, and keeping your one. None of us for work for emergency. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Steve, you, 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 and Dr. Choi, Steve, I can't help calling you Steve, Steve. he's my buddy. Um, but you, you were on TV, you were on CNN last week um, with, with, with Brianna Keeler. And she asked you about a timeline for how long this would take for people to, you know, for people to be self-isolating. Um, can you walk through some of your thoughts on, you know, from your perspective, whether social distancing is working and how long do you think it'll be until, you know, people's lives go back to normal? Yeah. So, you know, I want to um, distinguish between self-isolating and, and social distancing. Um, we're not telling people to self-isolate indefinitely. Um, Self-isolation is for people who are infected. Um, so you, you don't need to isolate in a room um, unless you've got laboratory confirmed COVID or you've been in close contact with, let's say a household member who is the laboratory confirmed COVID. And then you wanna separate from that infected individual. And then self-isolation means try to sleep, you know, within your limits, separate bedroom, use a separate bathroom, don't use the same kitchen, you know, wipe down the, the knobs, those high touch surfaces, but mm -hmm. social distancing, which is what we're trying to promote around the country now. That, I think that's, a, that's your question. You know, how, how long are we gonna be? Yeah, how, how, how long are we gonna be stuck in this box? Exactly. <laughs> um, my, my best guess, Sam, and looking at all the models, and you know, we just reviewed um, a pre-published um, manuscript um, out of a number of you know, highly respected academic centers, we're, we're looking two, three months. Um, and I think certainly in the state of Connecticut, I think our worst weeks are, are ahead in the next two or three weeks. So mid to late April is when we're expecting to see that big surge or that peak of both hospitalizations and ICU uh, demand amongst our hospitals across the state. And New York is probably a week or two 
ahead of us, and, and they're probably going to see their toughest week in the next week. Yeah, and you know, there's been a lot of spec. You know, people have been talking about will this go away when there's warm weather, um, and also potentially return in the fall in the fall and winter. Um, could you address that? And also importantly, um, are we going to have an NFL football season? And will the Jets make it the Super Bowl, or will nobody yeah. make the Super Bowl? <laughs> well, um, I'll answer that last question. I, I think uh, this might be the one gift for us, Sam. I think the Jets may win the uh, AFC East. Thank you to Tom Brady leaving the Patriots. That's very true, Steve. Yes. That's very true. But in, in terms of seasonality, um, we know that many respiratory viruses and, and certainly other coronaviruses tend to dissipate during the warmer climates. Um, now, that could be for a number of reasons. And number one, there may actually be some seasonal temperature variation in terms of how long these viruses can survive in warmer climates. And at least, you know, in the, in the first few months of this epidemic, now pandemic, it does look like the majority of cases are in the northern hemisphere, as opposed to the warmer southern hemisphere continents and regions. Um, another, you know, factor is that, you know, during the summer climates where it's warmer, uh, people don't tend to aggregate inside, uh, which, which is a, you know, another common means for transmission where you see a lot of people um, crowding into large spaces indoors. Um, but, you know, we can be optimistic that, that that might happen. I think it's way too early to say. I think some experts, you know, are saying, no, it's not going to happen. You know, I'm one of those that tend to be optimistic. So I'm hoping that come summer, the cases will go down. But more importantly, I think come summertime, the cases will kind of sort of run its course through, 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 through Connecticut and, hopefully through you know, our continent and the rest of the US. In terms of the second, third waves, you know, a lot of that comes from you know, um, our historical trends, you know, the, the great Spanish flu you know, in the early 1900s. You know, when, when people stopped isolating or stopped quarantining, you know, new cases came out and it spread again like wildfire. The second wave is worse than the first wave there. Exactly, yeah. and you know, we're seeing that in, in you know, isolated anecdotal stories from Asia, and, and certainly in Europe as well, too. So the answer is, let's hope. Um, there, there could be a chance, but, you know, no one really knows. And do we know that if you get COVID um, and, you know, do, do you build up the antibodies to then prevent it the next time? Um, what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the, I guess, current uh, medical um, establishment's thoughts there? Sure. So uh, theoretically, um, you know, once you recover from this virus, you should develop certain antibodies. Um, and we have two types of antibodies. We have the ones that you develop immediately uh, during that acute phase. And, and, and sometimes that acute phase can actually make your body sicker because there's a lot of inflammation. But over time, you should develop bodies, uh, antibodies that protect you from uh, repeated infections or give you long-term immunity. Um, and it's interesting because there are a couple um, studies going on right now where uh, certain healthcare centers, certain hospitals are, are taking uh, blood donations from, from patients who've recovered, taking the plasma, which contains a lot of the antibodies, and actually transfusing it back into patients who are having more severe disease with the intention and the theoretical um, uh, target of giving those antibodies to those patients who are not recovering, who haven't developed antibodies, a chance at fighting the progression of the disease. So, you know, so there are people who say you could get it twice, and I think it's a little early uh, to say, but I think given the numbers in China, um, the, the decreasing numbers of active cases and the overwhelming number of recovered patients, which is, last I checked, over 90%, Sam, I, I think the notion that yeah you're going to get reinfected is, is not as likely as the notion that w once you have the virus, you're more than likely to, to be immune to it. Um, and we're hopeful that that's the case. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'll switch gears over to um, a topic you and I have discussed, which is uh, PPE and ventilators. So you know, it's been pretty frightening to hear reports about lack of the you know, personal protective equipment from doctors and nurses at hospitals, lack of ventilators. What's the status for the Yale New Haven system in Connecticut 
on PPE and ventilators? And what are you hearing from your colleagues in New York? Sure. So at Yale New Haven, we have you know, at least a couple hundred thousand masks, but that can, that can be burned very quickly, meaning that, that can be used up very quickly. Um, we, we certainly have enough ventilators now, but again, it's very important for people, you know, in, in the general audience to understand, once we use a ventilator um, for a patient with COVID, those patients typically stay on a ventilator for two, three, sometimes four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. The typical ICU patient, you know, is on a ventilator for a few days. So it's not just the number of ventilators we have, it, it's the duration of time that these patients um, require a ventilator. So the longer we stretch out the transmission, uh, the more compliant we are to social distancing and certainly self-isolation if you are infected, the better chance we have in terms of having enough supply. Uh, with the masks, um, you know, a number of centers, including ours, is um, we're trialing you know, resanitation of masks as well, and, and the initial results are, are very promising. Um, at Yale New Haven, we're taking vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Um, so that's the same product that you see in those you know, alcohol rubbing solutions. And we actually use that to disinfect uh, a lot of our hospital rooms. So weeks ago, uh, we actually collected all those masks, all, all those respirators. And uh, in our lab, we've been vaporizing these masks for you know, a couple hours, and we're testing them. Um, and we're using uh, what we call bacteriophage, which are viruses that, that we actually grow. I mean, it's a centuries old um, uh, form of medicine where we, we can actually give these uh, sort of homegrown uh, viruses to, to patients uh, who are immunocompromised that, that actually attack bacteria. And we're actually using those bacteriophage to make sure that they, they don't actually live on these masks after we vaporize them. And, and the initial results are great. So um, the vaporizing uh, technique works in terms of killing any coronavirus that we may have on those masks. And the yeah. next step is making sure the filtration uh, process um, maintains its integrity. And we, we've actually sent these masks out to a separate lab in Utah. Uh, to make sure they're properly, you know, regulated, and we're hoping that we can start resanitizing these masks. And we hope, you know, um, once the lab gets up and running, we can sanitate, sanitize, you know, thousands of these uh, every week. So that's been very yeah. promising. And are you passing that learning on to other hospital oh, systems? Absolutely, we've published it, uh, and twice a week uh, we're on uh, a call with our colleagues, uh, particularly in the Northeast. So. You know, I'm on call with the other chief quality officers at, at uh, Columbia, Cornell, Johns Hopkins, and you know, uh, particularly Columbia, who's got the biggest experience right now. They, they've been sharing with us what, what they've been seeing, and and what we share with them, you know, what, what we're doing with the sanitation process. Um, and in terms of the ventilators, you know, we've done something very, you know, um, uh, innovative where we've taken ventilators and we've created a circuit where we can split with a T-piece and ventilate two patients. Um, and although we haven't done that yet here, we've actually met, uh, modeled that with um, um, mechanical uh, artificial lungs to make sure that we can generate enough pressure and flow to uh, keep two patients alive on a ventilator. And, and Columbia Presbyterian has been doing that. They, they've shared their protocol with us, you know, with the same intent that you know, this is a time to share as much knowledge as possible with all of our colleagues, uh, not just in the U.S., but around the world. That's great. It's great to hear that you, know, you guys are, are, are sort of trying to trying to find ways to save, you know, save as much equipment as possible and use it. Because yep. it's a sad thing in this country that, that, that we don't have um, enough equipment for the surge that's coming. And you're, you're being innovative about doing that. Um, well, you know, I've seen a lot of reports about doctors becoming sick, um, um, New York City, Boston. Um, do you have sick doctors and nurses in Connecticut? And, you know, what really, what do you, New York, I've heard a lot of very scary things and would love to hear your perspective about what's happening there. Sure. No, it's, it's scary. And um, it, it gets scarier every day. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, I lost a uh, very dear 
a colleague of mine uh, back in New York this morning. I'm sorry to hear that, Steve. Very prominent pediatric neurosurgeon who uh, cared for you know thousands of children, and so that that really hit home to me. Um, and I think I, you know, I, I called you when it happened, and you know, it was it was a, it was a tough moment for many of us who knew him. Um, but you know, every day we have, we have stories of doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists who really are some of our you know unsung heroes. You know, they're right at the front line taking care of those ventilators. So. You know, I have a big shout out to all those RTs uh, that are working in the ICU. Um, and we definitely have doctors and nurses um, in the state that, that are getting sick as well, too. Uh, so we, it's frightening. And, you know, we expect to see more. And, you know, the sad thing is you do the math. Um, and there's no doubt that, you know, we will lose colleagues here at Yale. Um, it's you know, we lost a lot of doctors in China and Italy as well, um, and you, you guys are really on the front line of it. And it's 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 hard to imagine. No, um, and all, all all we're asked to do is uh, sit and watch Netflix. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I'm I'm going to open it up to Q and A pretty soon. Um, you know, have, have have one more question, Steve, about um, you know about treatment. Um, sure. When, when someone comes in. Who's, who's acutely acutely ill, mm -hmm. what are you trying? Are you trying, you know, antivirals, um, yeah. hydrochloroquine? Are you trying yeah. one thing for one patient, one thing for another? Or is it throw everything at everyone and see what sticks? Um, so what, what we've done at Yale, um, just because, you know, we, we're the largest provider. We have, you know, 3,000 of the beds. Uh, we're taking an approach of, standardizing treatment so that we could learn faster and better rather than having each clinician, you know, do his or her own thing. So, uh, you know, our regimen, which is a regimen that, you know, many practices are, are, are adopting, uh, particularly the large academic centers, is a combination of, and I'm going I'm to actually, instead of using trade names or generic names, I'm going to use the category uh, for the audience. So we're using anti-malarial drugs. Um, we're using uh, anti-retroviral drugs, and the most common retroviral is the, uh, the uh, HIV drugs, right? Um, we're using the anti-Ebola virus drugs, and we're also using a monoclonal antibody um, that's targeted to uh, decrease the in inflammatory response. Um, and then, you know, the other therapy I mentioned was, you know, the reconstituted plasma, which is taking the blood, particularly the plasma of survivors and then transfusing it to the people that are really sick. Um, and some centers are actually using a, a particular antibiotic. Um, it's the, you know, very common z pack antibiotic. Yep. And there's some initial results um, that, you know, may be uh, suggestive of an improvement, but in all of these drugs, including those antibiotics, uh, have side effects. Um, and some of those side effects can be fatal. Uh, but what the consensus is, is that uh, the sooner you treat the patients, um, the more likely they'll have a chance at survival. And so when patients are coming in and requiring oxygen, you know, we start giving them these drugs before it gets too late. And when I say too late, it's that process I was describing before where the lungs fill up with that thick, you know, that, that thick pasty, yeah. Uh, goo inside the lungs where uh, the lungs then become non-functional. You, you can't get oxygen to your body and then your other organs start to fail. Great, Steve. It's really, um, it's, it's sobering, but it's, it's, it's really, you know, great for all of us to hear the truth of what's going on and get, and get more informed. So with that, I'm going to open up to Q&A. We have a number of questions already in the queue and everyone, please feel free to, to add questions and I don't know how many, I, I'll, I'm gonna get through as many as I can um, and be respected because Dr. Choi, um, you know, needs some sleep himself because you, you, you gotta take care of yourself, buddy. Um, we, we have a question um, about donations of PPE. Sure. Um, is Yale New Haven accepting them? Um, what can people do and across the country? Because people, we have people listening across the country. What can people do to help their local hospital systems? Um, number one, the, the most important thing people do is practice social distancing. Um, 
with donations, uh, you know, we do have a separate department that handles donations. Um, and so they, they will um, take those donations, they'll take those calls, and, and they'll determine if, if those donations are, are, are appropriate to use uh, with our healthcare workers. Um, you know, pe people have asked me about some of the handmade masks. Um, yeah, we're not awesome. using them now. Uh, there may come a point where we, you know, absolutely have to use them or we'll use them in combination with a mask, but right now we're only using the, you know, FDA, CDC regulated uh, masks that um, we call those N95s, but we're open to taking any donations at this point. Um, and there's a separate department that, that's handling those um, offerings. And, and we thank everyone for giving their time and resources you know, for those donations. That's fantastic. Um, we have two questions about asthma. Um, and they're from an anonymous attendee, um, and I guess they're probably from the same person, but um, one, what should an, an asthmatic person do to prevent COVID-19 as an additional precaution? And if an asthmatic patient is in somewhere like New York City, should they get out of the city immediately? Um, is there a need to, 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 to leave an area or is just staying in your apartment enough to, uh, and kind of isolating um, during, during this time? Sure. Um, you know, while I can't tell everyone to leave New York City because you know, that, that's something I, I, I don't have any, you know, authority to do, it, it's, it's a risk being in Manhattan right now. Um, you know, they've got, I think, over half of all the cases in New York, uh, New York State, that is. But if you do have asthma, um, most people who have cr chronic asthma, uh, those people who have children with asthma, um, you, you know what your triggers are. Um, so, Whatever you could do to limit those triggers, um, you've got to exercise that with, with high precaution. So if you have exercise-induced asthma, then don't exercise. Um, if you've got you know, seasonal allergy-induced asthma, it might not be the best time to be outside if that's what the triggers are. Um, because what happens with asthma is that not only do your airways um, tighten up, Inside those airways, um, there's inflammation, you know, just, just like what COVID does to your lungs. So the last thing you want to do is have an asthma attack during this pandemic, uh, because if you do get infected on top of an asthma attack, um, the chances that you, you'll have severe symptoms is, is pretty high. And then we have some questions about, you know, the safety of opening mail or picking up a newspaper um, getting groceries um, into your house. What should people do um, with the common day things, even if we're self-isolating, anything coming into our home, um, you know, what do you recommend uh, that people do? Sure. Um, I, I think the most conservative approach is, you know, if you are going to go to a grocery store, I don't wear gloves, but I do always carry um, some hand sanitizer with me. Um, I don't wear a mask, but I always practice social distancing. And then when I come home, you know, any of those products, you know, I'll just wipe down. Um, so if you want to take a conservative approach with mail, you can leave it outside for several days because I think that's probably a long enough period for that virus to die and not, you know, continue to be a, a risk in terms of contamination. But anything you can do to, to you know, minimize your risk of these respiratory droplets. I mean, that, that's really the primary mode of transmission. Um, I know, and, and I understand the general public's, you know, concern that, you know, if you touch anything, you'll get infected. That, that's not the common mode of transmission. The overwhelming mode of transmission is if you're infected, Sam, and you and I were sitting within six feet and you came and gave me a big hug or tried to kiss yeah. me, and you coughed on me, that landed in my, you know, those droplets landed in my nose or in my mouth and, and even in my eyes, you know, that's where I could get infected. And that's why healthcare workers, you know, taking care of patients with COVID, you know, they have to wear not only a mask, but they've got to wear a face shield or, or goggles to prevent it's transmission. Getting, it's getting up. And then <laughs> washing, should it be wiped down? Should it be soap and water? Should it be Clorox wipes? What should, yeah, you know, so what should be so, you know, if, you, if you're going to make your own uh, disinfectant, uh, you know, I, I would go on the CDC website. They've got clear guidelines, but, 
you know, really using a, a good detergent. You know, what we recommend is a solution that's at least 70% alcohol, um, which is different than the hand sanitizers. You know, we recommend a, at least 60% alcohol. Right. And then, you know, you, we, we discussed earlier about the test, you know, testing, but um, it, I know Abbott announced they have a, fi a five minute yeah. test um, and you yeah. guys just got new tests um, in, in New Haven. Yep. Um, can you talk a little about, you know, how that's changing? Sure. Um, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the testing capacity has really drastically increased, you know, particularly this last week um, in, in a very good way. Um, it's really, unfortunately, where we need it to be weeks, months ago, but um, we've got a new rapid test that, you know, can turn over a result within a couple hours. And then Abbott, uh, which is another big biomed company, is coming out this week with a, a test which will turn over results in minutes. Um, so most hospitals will now have the capacity to do hundreds of tests uh, within that same day, within hours. Uh, and before, just as a comparison, you know, we were able to do less than, let's say, a dozen tests uh, per day. And that turnaround was close to a week uh, because all those tests had to go to the CDC. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was really tragic, um, the lack of testing we had in this country. And I think that, that's going to really uh, create a lot of mortalities and morbidities that could have been avoided. And that probably moved We're optimistic us. that yeah, the, yeah. the testing capabilities are just starting to pick up speed and, and that'll help, you know, with isolated containment that, that can still be established. And by isolated containment, um, what I mean is if you've got a specific region or facility like a nursing home that has a, a positive lab confirmed test, um, you, you can rapidly test all those residents in that nursing home and do containment measures. Um, with mitigation, you can, you know, rapidly test a large community um, like our hometown and yep. you know, enforce, you know, greater uh, social distancing uh, restrictions and, and still um, bend that curve, you know, flatten that curve with, you know, broad mitigation strategies. So it's not too late for testing to make an impact. You know, I, you know, I'm not going to look in the rearview mirror and say I wish because we have to move forward. So I think the testing capabilities will will certainly still have a positive impact on how we could slow down the spread. Yeah, but I, I have another question about um, you know another de delivery question. I think because I think everyone really knows we have to isolate at home. Can can we can you get it from eating food? So food gets delivered, um, you know, and I think everyone like I, I want to support my local restaurants and you know and, and local businesses here. Um, and you know what's the safe way to do that? Sure, um, I do too. And you know what I've told all my friends: you know the safest thing is to cook and eat the food that you have at home. Um, not all of us can do that for for a number of reasons, um, but you know theoretically you can get it from delivered takeout food, but you can also get it from a also contact uh, who's infected as well too. But you, you can certainly um, get, get the infection if you, you know, let's say pick up uh, a bowl of soup that, you know, happens to have a respiratory droplet and you ingest it and it goes into your mouth or your nasopharynx. So these are microscopic particles. So yeah, theoretically you can certainly get infected from any uh, consumption of food or consumption of a beverage. We have a question from Jim Kenny um, in Yale Development. This is a good question here. If someone's calling their healthcare provider thinking they may have COVID-19, what information should they have in hand before making that call? Sure, uh, that's a great question. And that's a great question uh, because that's probably one of our number one questions at the call center. Um, so the things that you, you wanna be prepared for is, is getting a good history of when your symptoms started. Uh, and what are the specific symptoms you have? And uh, certainly travel history, particularly in the neighboring, you know, sort of hot zones or epidemic zones like New York City, Westchester, 
Um, and being able to answer questions like, you know, have you actually really measured your temperature? Um, it's a, a, exceedingly hard for adults to self-diagnose a low-grade temp. So yeah. for you and I, we, we, we may not know that we've got a temperature of 100.3, 100.5. So it's important to actually take your temperature and then talk about symptoms. You know, are you actually coughing? Do you have shortness of breath? Um, um, do you have a runny nose? Um, you know, if you had repeated fevers. Um, and that's important because if you test too early, Sam, there, there's a high uh, rate of false negatives. So a lot of people initially want to just all get tested. And that's great for containment strategies, but for mitigation, it's really hard because you could be walking around asymptomatic. Um, and you may actually test negative. And we're actually yeah. seeing, you know, uh, in unique cases where patients were tested twice and there are, there are, false, negatives. are there false positives as well uh, yes there's false positives but it's it's not nearly the rate of false negatives uh, the, the positives are very informative um, and they tell us a lot but false negatives you know it's really hard to know at this stage you know what to do with that result and we, but we false have a positives, of we're, we're taking that as as a gold standard that they are in fact infected. Okay. And we, we've actually a bunch of questions about, you know, should people wear N95 masks, you know, as they go out into, into the world right now? Um, is it helpful for them? And maybe the right question is maybe not until you guys have enough N95 masks in the hospital. Um, but what, what, what's your view on, um, you know, what, what, you know what, whether it's effective or homemade masks effective as well? Sure. So, you know, our, our collective response from the healthcare community is that these masks are intended for healthcare workers. They're not intended for the public. They actually have to be fitted so that they're properly sealed. And you're absolutely right. You know, these N95 masks are, are for healthcare workers because we need them. We're at a shortage. You know, I encourage people to donate them uh, because if we don't have enough, that means you won't have enough healthcare workers taking care of you, even if you do get sick. So they're not intended for the general public. They're specifically designed and made for mm -hmm. the people who are taking care of the people who are sick. And does, uh, does, does my New York Jets bandana work? Homemade masks? Um, you know, I, I don't think anyone would say a uh, bandana or something covering your mouth won't help you from getting other pathogens, other bacteria, you know, other community acquired illnesses, but for something as microscopic as uh, COVID, the likelihood that a, a bandana is gonna keep uh, COVID from getting inside your airway and your nose is very low. I have uh, two questions here that are similar. One from Kara Zyman, um, is there a vaccine in the scope for, you know, in, in, the, in the near future? What are your thoughts there? And then, from William Shikani, um, what's the status of an antibody test? Similar to what it seems like Germany is starting to in institute um, an antibody test. So, you know, after someone's sick to determine if they were sick, are they then okay to go out and work and, and sure. do their job in the public? Great, great, great questions. Uh, you know, everyone's been talking about vaccines. I mean, we're hoping that there'll, there'll be a accelerated production, but more importantly, an approved vaccine. And it's, it's really the, the approval that's gonna take a long time. You remember, you gotta remember that, you know, we have to test the vaccine, you know, in animals as well as humans. And then even if it were to be approved, um, to actually produce that on a scale, uh, which would be impactful for, for the entire globe is gonna take, you know, months and months and months. And, you know, the best guesses from, you know, our epidemiologists, you know, our scientists is that, we're talking about a year. Um, uh, with regard to the question about antibodies, that's a fantastic question. So from an epidemiologic standpoint, what we're, uh, m many countries and, and many uh, centers are doing studies to see if you actually do develop these antibodies. And that's kind of a reference to what we we're talking about earlier, Sam, is the reconstituted um, plasma that we're you know, giving back to patients. You know, is, is that impactful at all? Um, and the only way it would be impactful is that if you actually have antibodies, you know, to COVID. Um, 
So the FDA has, you know, a very clear guideline of, you know, how you collect the blood, you know, all, all the screening processes that you have to take in order to take, uh, take samples uh, properly. And we, we need approval from the FDA before we actually use it for, for patients who are not responding and are refractory to, to uh, conventional therapies, which are the ventilators yeah, and all the drugs. Talking about earlier, though, is, you know, it seems like Germany is talking about doing, um, doing, anti do, doing antibody tests after the fact, so testing a broad swath of the population yeah. to see who has it. And if you've had it, and even if you were asymptomatic, I'd be curious, you know, how many, the percentage of asymptomatic patients you think are out there. Absolutely. Um, but and that's, can you then go out in society, and is that sort of a way to get our economy started? Um, what are your thoughts there? Well, um, you know, I'm not going to comment on the economy on this forum. <laughs> Accelerate Yale and Yale. Yeah. We, we, we are looking, you know, we're, we're looking for insight there. But, you know, but, uh, we've, we've got one group of researchers that, you know, my, my team is, um, you know, collaborating with. Uh, you know, that's our infection prevention team. And we're actually trying to do just that, is to do, you know, what we call the contact tracing of people who've been infected and people who've been exposed to get a better understanding of, you know, how, how does this virus spread? Um, does it actually spread with asymptomatic carriers or predominantly with symptomatic carriers? And the way to do that is to actually, you know, not only test them, but also test their immune response. And so these are strategies that, you know, um, we often do with in initial stages of containment when we have an endemic or epidemic of a community trans transmitted disease. But yeah, I think in the next months to come and certainly throughout the next year, we'll see a lot more studies, uh, you know, not only coming out of Europe, uh, Asia, but, but certainly in the US. And you know, we're, we're, we're getting to time and, and, and um, Steve, I wanna make sure that, make sure you get, you get your, your, your beauty sleep there. Um, you know, m m maybe I'll close and, you know, we, we've, we've talked about a lot of topics that are pr pr very scary tonight and I I, I've learned a lot um, and I've even talked to you before. So I've learned a lot here tonight. And I, I know we have a large audience out there. What can you say about, you know, the potential to really cure this? Um, I know time frame is hard to predict, but what are some of the, you know, the optimistic and positive things um, that you're seeing out there? from the medical community coming together, and then all of society um, really coming together to try to tackle this, um, this pandemic? Sure. Um, you know, I think a lot of the new uh, pharmacologic therapies that, you know, we talked about, um, particularly from the early reports overseas, has really cued us into saying, you, you know, if you treat these patients earlier, um, they definitely tend to respond better. Um, and I, I think that's something we've learned from, you know, the other countries who've really just kind of experimented. And by experimenting, I mean, there's a lot of variation, but I, I think the, the sooner we come up with a sort of standardized cocktail, and I say cocktail because, you know, I don't think there's going to be a silver bullet for COVID. I don't think there's going to be one drug, one agent that's going to really cure this disease. And in fact, there's going to be no cure. You know, it's, it's going to be a, a process of, you know, managing the, the sickest patients in our ICU and making sure those patients get, you know, um, therapy right away. Uh, but, you know, I think my, my, my comment really in closing is that I, I think this was a real test and, and will be a test for society and, and for mankind and for the world, uh, you know, not only to be more socially conscious, but you know, to, to be collaborative and, you know, put our differences aside and uh, understand that the only way we're going to get through this is that if we work as a global community, uh, not as isolated pockets of, you know, uh, political conflicts, cultural conflicts, um, you know, this virus, you know, ha has no biases. And the only way to tackle this successfully is that, you know, we put aside our biases too. And I hate to be corny, but that's the best I got for you, Sam. Well, D Dr. Choi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And on thank behalf you. of Accelerate Yale, Yale Angels, the Yale Alumni Health Networks, um, um, the Yale Alumni Association, and all of us listening, um, this was fantastic. And thank you so much for, for doing everything that you're doing um, 
on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, you know, I think all of us hopefully will be helping you by staying at home and uh, not getting sick and helping to flatten the curve. Yeah. Well, so, thank you, Sam. Big shout out to my uh, Westport gamers. Absolutely. Love you guys. Okay. Take care, Thanks so much. Thanks everyone okay. for joining us tonight.